hello. I'm going to talk about how you can make the internet faster. Uh, what specifically I mean, how can you write uh, fast applications? How can you tune your Linux or BSD servers that host your services? And how can you improve uh, your networks at home or in, in, the, in your space or at a uh, workplace or whatever? And uh, first, we're going to talk about how can you build a better application. Um, but no, first I'm going to talk about myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm an apprentice since uh, 2020 at a Linux distributor. Uh, and uh, I like server hosting things. I, I like to do mostly OS level things. And I sometimes read RFCs, IETFs, kernel code, etc. I uh, am sort of a C novice, I would say, but I uh, just yeah do this and that. Not sure how to describe what I do. <laughs> uh, and I like to present other people's work. This is not the first time that I've talked at a event about what other people are doing in the world. So yeah. I'm not, I don't, I haven't uh, written anything specifically here. I'm just going to show you what you can do. Um, and this presentation is licensed under Creative Commons, and you know, as most talks here. Uh, so, writing better applications. If you write a small, let's say, script, and uh, you have to interact with a network device that does, has a REST API, for example, there you might be doing it in Python, because Python is a popular scripting language. And uh, if, you, if you do, there's this uh, whole thing where you can do uh, this whole uh, post and a GET request, which, are, which you hopefully know. Uh, in HTTP, HTTP, there's multiple ways to give a server information about what you want. Uh, so if you just follow the documentation of this request library in Python, of this module, it'll tell you just do request or post, and you're doing a request. Nice. Uh, and then maybe you, you're adding, you have to interact with some sort of appliance, and you have a list of items you want to tell the appliance. In this case, we are adding like console ports to a network uh, device. And what we have to do is we have to iterate through a list of devices we need to configure. And so that means we're doing a lot of put requests, a lot of HTTP requests here. The problem here is that uh, we are doing them separately. Uh, for each request that we do, what we need to do is first resolve um, the DNS of our uh, console, then we have to create a TCP connection, then we have to uh, do a TLS connection because it's encrypted. And then finally here we can actually do a put request and then get a response back. Uh, I'll put it here in twice, that's, that's a mistake. Uh, and then you, we close the connection because in this current application, if you follow the example, all you do is say request post, and it will open a connection and close the connection. Um, why is that a problem? Because round trip time. You might have ever typed in the ping command into your terminal, and you know that, hey, this machine is 30 milliseconds away from me. It takes 30 milliseconds for our round trip, which is I send a message, I get a reply back, and that reply back arrives at my, at my, at me, uh, uh, arrives where I am. And uh, if we just do it this naively, we actually end up doing this eight times, going back and forth. So if this script here, like for example, if I have, uh, let's say, 50 entries, and I'm doing this whole loop for 50 entries, well, that means theoretically, eight round trips per request. So that's 240 milliseconds. 
Uh, and if, if that server's in, on a different continent, it might be even worse. And if we have 50 entries, it can take 12 seconds to run this whole script. And if it's uh, in, a, in a different continent, it might be 60 seconds. <laughs> so the, obviously, uh, not obviously, but uh, this, is, this might annoy us, so we might want to improve a script. And what we can do is reuse the connection where we go through this whole process of setting up our connection and just reuse it. Uh, the code change here is that we uh, use this request library from Python and open a session. Add our headers here that we uh, need. This is, this is to turn off uh, uh, TLS verification uh, because it's a self-signed certificate. <laughs> And then we don't just post with the library, but we post in our session. And what this does is it moves our for loop to this part now, so that this whole setup part is now uh, no longer um, done. So we're reusing our connection. We're keeping it open. So our round trip is only, we only have to do one round trip. Yeah. And... Uh, that means if we have 50 entries, 30, 30 milliseconds times 50 is, oof. <laughs> oh, that's that's 1.5 seconds, if I'm not mistaken, D uh, excluding the the whole setup phase. It's definitely faster, a lot faster. Uh, so can we do that on the web as well? Yeah, if you if you're a website developer, web web developer. <laughs> Uh, what you can do is uh, uh, you might have followed a tutorial that says, hey, let's use a library, it's something like jQuery or whatever, and they tell you, just put, put this thing in the top of your uh, website into the header part. What you're doing here is you're, you're telling your browser, hey, uh, there's some information about how the website has to be rendered, and you have to get it from this address. If we, if we load a page like this, what happens is we first connect to your website, download the HTML, the browser starts parsing the HTML as, it's, as it arrives, sees, oh no, our CSS, CSS is somewhere else, and it has to connect to the other web server, and as we saw, that might be eight round trips at worst. We have to do a DNS resolve. We have to open a, HT, a, a TCP connection. We have to negotiate our TLS it's because it's a different domain for a different web server. Uh, even if it's not a different web server, it's still a different domain. And then uh, we can finally pass the style sheet, and then your browser can start rendering because Without the style information, the browser doesn't know what, how to display your website and it will block. So don't do this. Do, don't, don't use, put your essential CSS files or JavaScript files into, onto another web server because that just usually slows you down unless it's in cache. So if you're not a first time visitor, then it's not, then it's already in cache, but, um, the thing is, if you, if you think, oh yeah, but this is, they say this is a CDN, it, it, it should load the Java, JavaScript or the CS faster. Well, the thing is, if you, they, it's not really better because, again, you have to do all this whole stuff to get the resource. And if you need a CDN, by all means, then, then use a CDN. I mean, put your entire website behind a CDN on a single domain, and then I guess it's faster if it's if you care about international things, uh, international visitors, but, and stuff. And cross-site resource caching is dead. It has been turned off uh, in browsers years ago because of security concerns. So there's, uh, there's our whole argument that, oh, because this other website might be using the same library, it's already cached. But that's just not true because uh, browsers don't do that anymore. Externally embedded images are fine, of course. If you have a video or a YouTube video or image from another site, that's fine. You can include that. But the, the difference is that it, uh, 
doesn't block the rendering because your style sheets, yeah, like the, the parts that say, this is how my website looks like, they are already processed, and then you have just a blank field. That's fine. But this will make your website nicer and faster to use. Uh, and that's all I have to say about applications. Uh, next, we move on to tuning your servers, because uh, some of us like Linux, and we host stuff. Uh, but first, let's look at how basic inter-technology works again. TCP. TCP is that one protocol that we love and use. It's connection-oriented. It only works if we uh, build a connection. So we say, hey, I want to connect to you, and some we say, acknowledged. And we open two ports, and we can communicate with each other. It detects errors. It asks for retransmissions. If packets are lost, it will uh, say, hey, I haven't received this package. I'm expecting this package next. Where is this packet? Uh, this package, uh, what was the term? Tames, TCP uses, uh, was it frames? I'm not sure. Uh, datagrams? Oh, something. Sorry. But it guarantees, it guarantees a lot of things. It guarantees you that the stuff arrives in, in order. So that means if something was lost along the way and you try to read the, the data that you expect, it will block the read until you, that packet is missing. So it's strictly in order, which makes sense if you download a single file, but it's also a bit problematic sometimes. And you have to acknowledge packets. You have to, each time you receive something, you have to send uh, an acknowledgement as uh, the receiver. And uh, the sender will send a certain amount of packets, which is called the window of a window size, and then it waits for the acknowledgement, and then it continues with uh, the next window. It is just the window size, depending on your connection speed. And one very important thing that TCP does is it, it employs network congestion avoidance it does not want to overload your network. If you, we just blast the data as fast as we can through our interface, uh, we would have a problem because, yeah, I have a gigabit port, but if I am um, connected to a 20 megabit in, um, uplink, uh, I would blast a gigabyte through and most of the data would be dropped for, by the switch because it says, hey, I, I'm full, I can't store more, any more of your packets, I have to drop them, my buffer is full, and I have to send, uh, clear my buffer slowly. And that just slows networks down because we have a lot of packet loss. So what TCP does is, it starts off sending really slowly and until it notices, oh, there's congestion, it drops the sending rate and tries again. And this looks like this. This is uh, downloading a gigabyte, almost gigabyte file, on a gigabit connection. And as you can see, here's the, the start phase. We'll look at it closer. And then we drop packets here, and boom, the, the send rate drops, increases, increases, drops, increases, 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 drops, increases, increases, drops, and we have to stick saw, uh, this saw pattern. Uh, this is uh, using the, I'll talk about this later, but this is using the, the algorithm called Cubic, which uh, does this detection completely based on dropped packets. So it expects you to fill up the buffer, so you send and send and send, and you send faster and faster, and at some point your router or your switch says, no, I'm full, packet gets dropped, and uh, from the acknowledgments you see, hey, I'm missing this packet in the series. And uh, it, it keeps acknowledging maybe the, the later packages that are arriving, but it says, hey, I'm still missing this packet. And uh, the sender notices, realizes, oh, yeah, I'm sending too fast. Need to drop the rate. And then it keeps sending and sending more and more. But the more important part is this beginning phase. This is called the, the probing, where we uh, try to 
uh, touch the water, I don't know, um, test the waters, to find out well, how fast can we go. And um, uh, why is this important? We're not always transferring gigabytes of files or like big files. That's, we don't, I don't think that most of us, most of the time we don't download big files. It's just not what we do. Instead, we, we might transfer uh, smaller files, like a 500 kilobyte file. This is the same graph as earlier, but with a 500 kilobyte file. And as you can see, there are these pauses here, and it's very short. It's not even, yeah, this is in seconds. This is not even 100 milliseconds of transfer. What happens is that we, we are only probing. We are just trying to figure out how much can we send. And, but by the time we've already reached a win, um, increased the window, we're still not there. We, we still haven't reached the limit of our gigabit connection, so we are not transferring at gigabit speed because we were f trying to test if we even can do that. So we were transferring lower than gigabit speed, a lot lower, a lot slower. It, this transfer, I think the average was like 15 megabits, megabytes, so, so that's like over 100 megabits a second for half a, half a megabyte of file. So we have the bandwidth um, for the, in the connection, but we are not using, we don't get the transfer speed. And that's because of this probing. And um, so I'm going to talk about this. This is a TCP trace. Each, each packet that we send, uh, each IP packet is also packed as a TCP package. I'm not sure what it's called. Uh, we, we have the sequence numbers. We are we're counting up the packets, and we are saying, okay, I received packet one, packet two, packet three. Uh, and, and our slow download, it looks like this, a bit wobbly, but the average is pretty much a gigabit. This is, this is how it's supposed to look like. And this, this wobbly pattern is, is normal if you download at full speed. This is expected. In a perfect condition, two computers connected next to each other, you get dropped packets because that's how TCP works. Um, and uh, with a slow transfer, we didn't get that. Uh, what can we do? Um, this whole congestion control thing, like how fast do I have to send, how do I back off, that's, that's described in an algorithm, and that's called the congestion control algorithm. And uh, I mentioned Cubic. This is using Cubic, and the Cubic is the default in Linux since 2008 or something. On FreeBSD, that's New Reno, also similar uh, time frame. Uh, funny, funny thing is, Torrent uses UDP so that they can also implement their own congestion control algorithm, and they use one called LEDBAD, which aims to be uh, very conservative, and it, it starts really slow and it backs off really fast uh, in order to, to not compete with uh, the important real TCP traffic. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a nice detail. But there's also a newer algorithm called BBR, which has Google developed in the 2010s, and I think it's been in Linux 4.9 or something like that, or 4.14, so like seven years ago. But it's not the default, and it, um, it, it makes the probing a lot more aggressive because it's optimized for the web, for websites that have well, where they recognize, yeah, people have now a lot more bandwidth, but uh, Cubic is so conservative that it makes websites still feel slow. And uh, also a thing that has changed is that as networks got faster, there, there was a lot more buffering introduced. So your router with your source speed got a lot bigger buffer. What that means is that the, the packets are dropped much later which can lead to higher transfer rates to some degree, but it also leads to uh, a bigger delay. And uh, the, the congestion events are recognized much slower. 
So what the BBR also does, it, it looks at the latency of uh, the acknowledgements. If, if acknowledgements suddenly arrive slower and later, uh, it also detects that as a delay. And again, it's more aggressive, and it's also uh, compared, if, it's nec if you have a TCP cubic and a TCP BBR uh, sender machine competing for the same link, so a gigabit link, there's, study pa there's papers out there that BBRs are a lot more aggressive, and uh, traffic that uses cubic will be a lot slower if you have two big file transfers. But yeah, BBR is used especially by the big cloud services that make up most of our web traffic, and that makes them load a lot faster. Uh, Cloudflare wrote about this uh, in their blog, and uh, in their example, that with a five megabit simulated connection, they had something like yeah, an example that says 1.5 seconds load time for a WordPress site using BBR and eight seconds for one using Cubic. <laughs> uh, especially when they use HTTP2. HTTP2, HTTP2 really likes this more aggressive probing and uh, less slow start, faster start. <laughs> and uh, Cloudflare, they, they pull out these numbers and they mention these numbers. That's, this article is from 2018 and you might have seen them elsewhere. Uh, what they tell you to do is, um, using the sysctl uh, of your Linux system, again, this is Linux specific because BBR is not implemented on BSDs, at least not uh, mainline BSD. They tell you to use the BBR congestion control algorithm, and they also tell you to uh, add this uh, value that says that uh, your socket buffers are cleared, so packets are sent out if your socket buffer contains at least 16 kilobytes of data. Mm, what I'm talking about is if your program, if your application says, hey, I want to send now, I, I've, I want to send like a kilobyte, it's first going to sit in the socket on your, in your program, and only at some point the, your, your kernel will go and take this kilobyte of your socket buffer and send it to the network driver, and the network driver will send it to your NIC, your network interface, and then it will be sent out. So in order to reduce the delay on websites, they recommend this magic number, basically. And um, the, the Grafino OS dev um, developers also have a different idea about this. They, for example, are... Uh, recommend a higher uh, threshold. Uh, and also what uh, Cloudflare mentions is they want you to change the queuing discipline, and we'll talk about queuing disciplines later as well. But yeah, um, these are two main articles if you want to learn about what values to pick uh, and why they, they might do a decent job. I mean, the, the Cloudflare Art block article has a bit of magic to it. They don't explain everything, but they think they, they, get, they give you a great insight into the problems that they're solving. Uh, also, what helps is, I mean, if you run a web server, uh, use a newer HTTP version. If you're not doing, uh, if you don't have a reverse proxy, you can just change your config, and if you're using a five-year-old or newer release of Apache Engine X. Uh, I think in Apache you have to load a module as well. You can, you can use HTTP 2, which is the sequel to 1990s HTTP 1.1. And it's also, it also, you can have both at the same time. Uh, HTTP 2 is, it's, I think it's a Google initiative, like just like these days, uh, uh, Google and others like to push these things and implement, the, implement them in Chrome. And then because, Intel, uh, because Google has implemented it in Chrome, it becomes a standard, basically. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, but HTTP2 makes uh, things faster by uh, reusing a connection instead of, well, in, by, by having priorities and using a single connection to uh, even send multiple things at the same time, or uh, whereas HTTP 1.1 required that you have multiple connections open at the same time, I think that's called pipelining. Uh, yeah, but it, but it all helps. HTTP 3 is a thing as well. HTTP 3 uh, uses uh, not TCP, but Quick, which is like Torrent, it tries to implement their own TCP on top of UDP. Uh, and it, uh, it's again pushed by Google through that browser. And, uh, but it's not, it's not in any major release of Apache or Nginx, I think. It's only in experimental branches and uh, there's nothing to the state uh, that you can, in a, uh, where you can just use a stable release and have it. There's also multiple implementations of it uh, from Cloudflare and whatever, but nothing uh, just that has been merged. Uh, yeah, that's what you can do if you host something. Next thing, how can you uh, improve your own network at home? Uh, cake, anyone? Uh, if, you, if you have used OpenWRT, uh, you might have heard of this whole smart queuing thing, this whole cake thing. Uh, the idea is that uh, if, if uh, this whole delay detection thing is failing us, and if maybe our buffers are too big on the network, can we ourselves uh, indicate, be smart about it and indicate uh, congestion uh, to reduce latency? The problem is, um, so first of all, um, if, you, if you have applications, if you have sockets, uh, all these things are all queued up, have, Sockets are basically uh, a queue for each device, uh, for each application, uh, and they have to be some, at some point be sent to your network card. They're all computing for usually for one queue uh, on better high-end network interfaces. You have multiple queues, of course, but um, they, we have this one queue, and someone has to decide who can go first. And that's done in the Linux kernel through a queuing discipline, which sits uh, before the device driver, which might also have some mechanism for determining that. Intel does that for sure. They have their own quality of service stuff integrated into their driver and their firmware. Uh, but yeah, this is where you can do something. Uh, yeah, once, once it passes through that and then to the device driver and the NIC, it uh, will finally be sent to your network and then to your gateway. Uh, you can, I, you, one thing you can do is, you, um, one thing you can control always is your device. So you can uh, change the queuing discipline on your device. Uh, the default in Linux is uh, first in, first out. But in system D, the default is something called fair queuing codal, FQ codal, fair queue controlled delay, which says that um, if, if something, uh, if a, I think it was, if something, if, some, if, 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 something, if a queue is, gets really full, the, the, the queue will be uh, purposeful, purposely, uh, delayed in, uh, so a d delay is added so that uh, the queue fills up even faster and the drop, uh, the packet drops occur uh, faster, so the packets are drops faster so that uh, congestion is indicated earlier and the sending slows down earlier so that the uh, so that the connection backs off. 
faster. That was how it works. But that, that kind of helps, but where you really want it to be is in your gateway. Usually you have your DSL modem or cable modem or something, and that's usually much slower than your network speed. Well, most usually you have a gigabit network or a Wi-Fi 5, and especially on, on Ethernet, you notice that, that yeah, your gateway is really slow. And what your gateway should do is it should uh, stop buffering so much. <laughs> buffer bloat, because there's this whole thing called buffer bloat that um, has to be solved. Buffer bloat is when the buffer adds the, your, your hops on your network add too much latency, which there shouldn't be. You know, you, know, you type in ping and ho ping to a um, host. But the thing is, if you run a speed test under load, this latency can rise. This is done, uh, this was here at the Eager uh, of our Wi-Fi. And because the Wi-Fi can't saturate the whole uplink that we have, uh, the load, loaded um, latency wasn't that high, but at home and with my Fritzbox VDSL thing, I get uh, 300 milliseconds. And that's quite common. So you have a 300 millisecond la uh, latency if you fully saturate your connection, if you do a download. And that means that if you now try to also load a website or do a DNS request, this all takes 300 milliseconds of round trip time. That's slower than the latency to the US West Coast. And that makes the application slow. Websites, video calls, of course, especially if it's suddenly, uh, you, you will feel that, you, you will notice that especially if you have multiple users. And your, your, Excel, your router, your gateway, should do much better than, um, at this. Uh, and that's why, where, where Cake tries to help and other uh, traffic control algorithms. Uh, buffer bloat is when your hops buffer too much. If your latency increases, when you fully utilize your connection. If the buffers are too small, then you don't get enough throughput because too many packets are dropped and you can't fully utilize your link speed. So that's bad. But usually the buffers are too big. They, they don't add more throughput, but they just increase latency. And that's just unnecessary. And one idea is that we just don't fully utilize the link, and that we try to keep our latency consistent, and we don't optimize for maximum throughput, but maximum, but consistent latency. And that's what um, Cake does. Uh, again, latency rises if the slowest link is, slowest link is under, the, under high utilization. So if you have, so if it's at, close to 90, 95% or something like that. Uh, yeah, and it, it should notify about congestion, but it doesn't do it uh, well enough. It doesn't do it early enough. So, uh, what, 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 what Cake does, uh, in effect, is it drops packets earlier if they have been in the queue too long for a certain connection, I think think, uh, or it adds the, the control delay to indicate uh, that there's a congestion. And through its magic, magic basically, <laughs> to me, because to me, it kind of is magic, it adds a consistent latency. So your latency can actually stay at this 20, 20 15 milliseconds, even if you are running a Steam download and you're in a video call. That's, that's like the future that I want. I want to have someone... Uh, at my place running a Steam download and I don't notice it and my websites load just as fast. Because for, for home users, that is, I think, the, not an uncommon thing that if someone downloads a big file, the experience for everybody else sucks. Uh, in the last five years, I think, uh, recent uh, Wi-Fi access points have paid close attention to that too and they have improved to, compared to what you had 10 years ago, but... Uh, that's only regarding if you're saturating your whole Wi-Fi uh, bandwidth. 
if your whole Wi-Fi uplink is full, it, it, uh, it already does smart prioritization, and it can keep it, it kind of going and usable if your, if your ad space is fully utilized. Yeah, and Cake just makes so it keeps the, your, your web and app experience as far as, as still the same at the same speed, even if you're doing heavy downloading in the background. Uh, caveats are with Cake, Cake uh, is implemented in the Linux kernel, I think, since 4.19, and also in the open WRT uh, router fi uh, firmware. But the problem with it is it uh, requires me you to know the, your link speed. It doesn't, it can't, it's very bad at guessing your, how fast your internet speed is. And you usually use like 5 to 10% of your throughput. So your maximum download speed will be a bit slower. And it also breaks uh, NAT offloading, which is a feature that these cheap uh, Wi-Fi access points have to, uh, well, reach the speeds that they promise. Uh, this is relevant because most of us still need to use IPv4. Uh, and uh, yeah, you, so you need NAT, sadly. And uh, the, the, these cheap consumer devices have an offloading mechanism, and that's not compatible for, uh, with the cake algorithm. So you need to use your CPU. And sadly, these cheap access points have bad CPUs, so. No, they, they are not that the fastest. <laughs> there's a, if you are an OpenWT user, there's a, there are blog posts on the OpenWT forum that uh, benchmark how fast uh, the access points are if you're using Cake. Uh, hold on, yeah, that's, that's basically the end of my presentation. I just wanted to point out something I forgot. Uh, regarding these, these tweakables, they say IPv4, but they apply to both IPv4 and IPv6. There's no IPv6 dot TCP congestion control. Like mostly all TCP uh, sysvars are exported under IPv4, so they affect both, <laughs> even if it only says IPv4. Just saying. Yeah, that was my talk. Uh, I would be happy. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, that that this that's my talk. If you have any questions. Uh, please ask. <laughs> what? <laughs> I did not expect that. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, does anybody have questions? Like, I, I don't, uh, there might be parts of Skip Office. Yes, please, please. Yes. Do they? Uh, okay, the question was. Did the first box ask for the maximum speed of your uplink? Mm -hmm. uh, is this because they use cake as well? Do you know something about that? And so the question is uh, the first box asks for the maximum link speed, uh, and is it because they use cake? Uh, I, I would have to guess they don't use cake because I think their processes are too weak for cake. Okay. Just uh, that's, that's what I would guess. I think my Fritzbox model dot didn't ask me. Maybe it's just pulling it from the modem, but uh, the speed. But they have their own QoS uh, mechanism, so they. So this whole cake thing is not the same as QoS. QoS means that you classify packets based on ports or some IP flags. There's a DCP field in the IP packet, and you can say, oh, this is high priority traffic and something like that. Um, what you do is you put the traffic into multiple queues, and then you decide, oh, uh, there's something in this very important queue. I'm immediately going to process it and ignore the other queues. Uh, that's what QoS does, basically. You just split the traffic into classes. But that's not what Cake automatic does. Cake can do that too, but uh, you might not need to do that. It's, it's, uh, I know that the, the Fritz box have uh, quality of service, so they classify traffic, but um, 
that's a bit different. That's not the same goal. And uh, the, the problem really with Cake is I, th I, I think it's not very easy to implement in uh, hardware. I think that's just the biggest uh, problem why we don't see Cake. And that, it, that you need to know the uplink speed, which makes it unusable for mobile and Wi-Fi clients. Uh, yeah, but I wish more people would use Cake. But again, you need a PC processor, or you need to be smart to, or like you need a really good network interface that where you can implement it. Okay. Anything else? Uh, anyone? I can. I can. Yes. Yes, you can, uh, you can absolutely set it, if you, especially if you're using uh, Linux. Again, this is also not on FreeBSD, uh, or any BSD as I, as I know. You have to change this TCP congestion control to variable to either to Cake, but then the problem is you haven't given it any parameters. What Cake really wants you to do is give it, um, tell, tell, you have to tell it the speed. And uh, here on the GrapheneOS article that is linked in the presentation, uh, you, can, you can either run this command and then you say, oh, my speed is this, this big. And they say, uh, and that you use this, uh, the, what's called traffic control command, and then you replace the queuing discipline with this. I mean, on my system, if I... Uh, if you run QDisk on your Linux machine, oh yeah, I need to be root for that, of course. Nah, can't type in the password. Uh, it shows you the queuing discipline for your interfaces. Uh, link local, of course, doesn't need a queuing disk because it's so fast that you don't need anything, any queuing. Uh, but yeah, check out the Graphene OS article. They also even explain that you can, if, if you're using system D networking, I think you can set it in the service file if you're using system D. Uh, there's, there's ways to use it, but uh, the default already on most Linux distros is fqcodal, which is already better than first in, first out. So that sh might be already good enough. But, but K can do better. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? No? Yes? Oh, microphone, nice. Uh, yeah, you said that uh, Cake needs a beefy processor to work, so I'm asking myself... If beefy, I'm beefy processor then you find in your 30 euro access point. Okay, but so if I'm a Linux gamer and I want lower latency, uh -huh. I wouldn't have to sacrifice my FPS if I use Cake. Or is this something significant which mm. I could notice? No, I don't think it's significant on x86. Uh, it, 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 if you, where you will notice it, if you, especially if you run it on a server, if you have a 100 gig NIC, mm -hmm. then you might notice it. You would probably notice it on a 100 gig NIC. But... Uh, like these access points, like they usually struggle at like they can't reach gigabit speed with Cake. If you want to use Cake and have a gigabit download li uh, link, you probably need an x86 low-end Atom processor or like a beefy ARM core that's mm -hmm. almost the equivalent to a smartphone, basically. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And also, if you run Cake on your local machine, it's only, well, balancing the traffic that your machine generates, not what other people generate in your network. Okay. Last chance, questions? Don't see any. Okay. Thank you for listening. I'll pull up the... Thank you for watching as well. Oh, where is it? <laughs> yeah, the talk is online. Thanks.